All right. Well, um, oh, do, do I do I need this? I do I need it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I heard a yes, so I'm just gonna go ahead and use it. Um, yeah. My name is David Rimstead, and it's my privilege to be here with you guys tonight. Um, yeah, like my buddy said, we uh, were missionaries among a people group uh, called the Malayali. We did not uh, know. Well, let me just say this. No, nobody in this room, apart from you hearing a story, knew that Malayali existed. Ten years ago, we didn't know that Malayali existed either. The very first time we heard the Malayali language was the very first day we stepped into their tribe, heard their language for the very first time, and over time, we realized this is the people group that we want to plant ourselves in. So ultimately, what that looked like, just in a really condensed version, right? Because we're here to talk about the task that remains, not the task that was completed among the Malayali people. What we did was we moved in to the people group known as the Malayali. We uh, chopped down some trees, we milled those trees, we created lumber, we created houses, we started to live among them in order to learn their language. There's no Rosetta Stone for their language, and so we were hearing it for the first time. I remember walking outside uh, on the first day of learning language. After the houses were built, our, our families had moved in, and I hear, and I literally thought, how on earth are we going to learn this language? Like, this is ridiculous. But we got training, and ultimately, sounds turned to symbols, symbols to words, words to phrases, phrases to sentences, sentences to paragraphs, paragraphs to stories. And after three years, we arrived at fluency in the language of the Malayali people. After learning their language to fluency and their culture simultaneously, we created a literacy program in their language for them to read and write for the very first time. They're oral language only. Um, they had never held a pencil. They had never seen paper. We wanted to not only be able to share the gospel and have them hear it, we wanted them to see the goodness of God in scripture, have them be able to read it for themselves in their language. After creating a literacy program, literally creating an alphabet, having graduating classes of men and women and children that know how to learn or that learned how to read and write. We then began to translate portions of scripture, 54 chapters, kind of like 54 lessons overall from Genesis to Revelation to span the chronological redemptive story of history. After those translated portions were done, we began to create lessons to teach them that story from those 40 or 54 chapters from Genesis Revelation. And then this last, well, 2022, we were able to walk uh, with them from Genesis to Revelation, those 54 lessons, chronologically showing them the redemption that God has applied uh, to them through Jesus Christ if they would believe in the Son and they have 75 men and women and children have believed on Jesus for the very first time in the Malayali history. And um, yeah, certainly. And uh, it was a privilege. It was a privilege to be a part of that whole process. And ultimately, we're back stateside um, doing some health stuff for the next few years. But our our coworkers are there, the Earls and the Mullers, the Trots have just moved in. They're beginning to learn language. They're staying in our house, but our coworkers, the Mullers and the Earls, I mean, they're chugging away. We finished uh, the book of Acts before we had left. So those brand new believers, they've walked through Acts. They've walked through Romans. They're getting ready to start going through Ephesians. They just had their baptismal ceremony. Um, 57 of the growing number got baptized. They tried to do everybody in one day, but there was way too many people. And the hole that they had dug and that filled up with water got extremely muddy. So they were like, hey, we're going to push pause on this. Um, sometime, I'd love to come back and just share with you all the ins and outs and all the details. But ultimately, that's for another time. I think most importantly tonight, we can focus our attention on the task that remains. The task that remains, and ultimately what we want to do is ask this question, well, whose task is it? What we're going to do tonight is going to, we're going to walk through some really important questions in regards to the task that remains. We all know that there's a mission that God is on. What is that mission? 
Uh, how does that look? When is it going to end? What's the overall promise that we can hold on to? The first question that we want to ask tonight is whose task this is? Whose mission? If we're talking about the task that remains, then whose task is this? And ultimately, what we're going to find from cover to cover is it's God's task. But if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 9. I'm loving that. Everybody's heads go down. I hear zippers. Some of you are old school. <laughs> I don't hear any clicks, but I know they're there. Isaiah chapter 9. Whose task is this? What I want you to understand from Isaiah chapter 9 Where should I point it? Is it going? Yes. Okay. Uh, one back. Okay. What I want you to understand about Isaiah 9 is Isaiah 9 is a promise to the people of Israel. But this promise in Isaiah 9 is coming on the cusp of a prophecy that was made towards Israel that the Syrian army is about to come and carry them off. If you look just a little bit above chapter 9, you're going to find verse 8 verses 21 or chapter 8 verses 21 through 22. And it says this, they, meaning Israel, they will go from one place to another, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, they will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down at the earth. But wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They will be thrown out into the darkness. Isaiah is saying, listen, this is what's coming. Because of your unrepentant sin and your idolatrous worship, ultimately, you wanted to become just like the nations. And those nations are in the dark. And so what's happening is because you wanted to become like the nations, you are ultimately going to become just like them. You will live in the dark. You will be cast out of the presence of the Lord and you will become just like those whom you've been living among, the nations, dark. So the Assyrian army is going to come in and they're going to capture you and they're going to carry you off. And ultimately your privilege of being his and your purpose of being the light and paradise as you know it will be gone. But this, this is not the beginning of God's mission. But we have to ask ourselves the question, well, who's, whose task is this? Let's start in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, God created all things absolutely perfectly. And in creating everything perfectly, he created man and woman, male and female, Adam and Eve, and he placed them in a perfect paradise. They had the privilege of being his, and he was theirs. They had the purpose given to them in the commission of go forth, multiply, fill the earth. Ultimately, you're going to be my representatives. You're going to be my king and queen. You're going to have babies. You're going to fill up this earth with offspring, and you're going to fill out the entire ground with my glory. Oh man, they had absolutely everything that they needed, yet in Genesis chapter 3, they exchanged the privilege of being his and the position or the purpose for something so fleeting. Thinking that they needed something else, they were deceived in thinking that God was less than what he was. And they chose to disobey. They lost paradise, as we understand it in Genesis chapter 3, but they didn't lose their purpose, right? They began to multiply and fill up the ground. But what do we see coming to Genesis chapter 6, the story of Noah? Everybody knows it? Man, God looks down and he sees every intention of the heart, every inclination of the mind is completely and utterly evil. And so he chooses Noah and his family in a created order of animals, puts them on a boat, saves them in spite of the overwhelming flood that destroys absolutely everything. God starts over with Noah. And what does he do with Noah? Although he doesn't have paradise, God recommissions Noah with the same purpose of Adam and Eve. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. I'm with you. 
You have privilege. I am yours and you are mine. And the purpose, go forth, multiply, fill up the earth. And they began to multiply and grow exceedingly great. One language, one people. But what we find in Genesis chapter 10 and 11 is now they're congregating together and they're wanting to build a city. In and of itself, a city is not wrong, but they were intentionally building the city because they did not want to do what? Scatter. They did not want to fill out the earth with the glory of the Lord. They wanted to congregate together into one city. And when they built that city, they inevitably built a tower. They wanted God to come and look at them instead of them marveling at him. And so what does God do in Genesis chapter 10 and 11? He takes that one language and he makes it into many. He takes that one people and he scatters them across the globe. And there they go into darkness no longer having access to the privilege of being Yahweh's, no longer having access to the purpose that would be theirs through Adam and Eve, no longer having any form or shred of paradise. But then the Lord calls Abram, Abraham ultimately in Genesis chapter 12, a couple hundred years after the Tower of Babel, and he tells Abraham, listen, what I'm gonna do for you is what I did for Adam. I'm gonna give you the privilege of being mine and I will be yours and I will completely take care of you. I'm gonna give you your purpose back and you're going to be a light to the nations. And guess what? I'll give you paradise. I'm gonna send your people. I'm gonna send your family, your offspring to the land flowing with milk and honey. And finally, through trial, suffering, errors, mistakes, they finally make it into the land. Oh, they have the privilege of being his. They have the purpose of being the light and they have paradise. They have everything they've ever needed or could ever want. And yet they chose to look to the darkness, which were the nations that they were supposed to reach. And they became deceived, distracted, discouraged, but ultimately they ran after empty gods. And Isaiah comes along and says, the Assyrian army is coming. And when the Assyrians come, you will become like those you have been serving, dark. But, but according to Isaiah nine, but that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zeblon and Nephtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies among the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Isaiah said, listen, you will lose your privilege. You will lose your purpose. You will lose paradise. But there is coming a time where this beginning invasion will happen. The land of Zeblon and Ephetali, the first places that will be eventually hit, according to 1 Kings chapter 17, is the land of Zeblon and Ephetali, where the invasion begins. The mission of God will begin. The mission of God, the light will shine in the land of Zeblon and Nephtali. You're just going to have to wait. And ultimately, what we understand, according to 1 Kings 17, is the people of Israel are carried off. They lose their privilege of being his. They lose their purpose of being the light. And they ultimately lose their paradise. But according to Matthew chapter one, the king of kings is born. He's better than David. According to Matthew chapter two, he's better than Moses. He's an even greater liberator for Jesus not only was born to go into Egypt, but to come out of Egypt so he would be able to save his people, not just Israel, but all the nations. And according to Matthew chapter three, he is an even better savior, better than Noah. For when Jesus went down into the water and the dove descended upon him, the Holy Spirit coming down to show, just like the dove was coming down to show Noah, the floodwaters are receding, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, falls upon Jesus and says to everyone there, Satan, sin, and death have met their match in this 
man. And the father says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And then in Matthew chapter four, Jesus willingly steps into the wilderness and he is tempted in every way, just like we are. And he obeys his father perfectly. Jesus did in 40 days what Israel couldn't do in 40 years and what Adam never did in the garden. He obeyed his heavenly father perfectly. And then after all that authentication, do you know what Jesus does? In Matthew chapter four, it says this. Now, when he heard, now, when he heard that John had been arrested, Jesus, Jesus withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of where? Zeblon and Nephtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zeblon and the land of Nephtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them the light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus began his father's mission. Jesus, according to Isaiah chapter nine, was the very first one with the privilege, the purpose, and the future paradise all culminating in him. He shines the light for the very first time in utter darkness, for there was no one else the people that God had chosen were no longer a light, but they were carried off into the darkness. Jesus steps into the land where the assault began. Zeblon and Nephtali and Jesus shines the light for the very first time. Whose mission is this? It's God's. And why is it his mission? Because he cares so much for the nations. He cares so much for all those who are his. And Jesus begins this mission by intentionally authenticating who he is, the King of Kings, the greatest liberator, the, our number one savior, and the personification of Adam and Israel. And therefore, when that the authenticating process has finished, Jesus steps in and begins not his ministry, but his father's mission. And then, and then, according, there we go. Nope. According to Jesus's final words. Listen, I don't want you to miss this. It's not just about the nations. We read Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and we get the scope of where we ought to go, the nations. We get, to, we get the roadmap in Acts chapter one, where he says, start in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then to the outermost parts of the world. But I want you to see something so incredibly important about Matthew 28. Jesus commissions us with privilege, with purpose, and with a coming paradise. Jesus stands in front of his disciples and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And according to the New Testament, we understand that we are now sons and daughters of the most high king. Jesus is not just a king, he is the king. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one that created all things by his breath, by his word, all things are sustained. And Jesus Christ came to wage a war against Satan's sin and death that we could not. Jesus lived the life that we couldn't. He died the death that we deserve. And he rose again to give us eternal life that we could have never earned on our own. Jesus Christ, after making purification of sins, Hebrews says he sits down at the right hand of the father because his work is finished. 
Man, by his authority, we are now sons and daughters of the most high king. And do you know what that means? That means privilege. You are his and he is yours. And you have every single spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And no one can take it away because you are sealed and guaranteed by the sealing of the Holy Spirit that all those things are awaiting you in heaven where nothing will destroy Man, your life, your life is his and he is yours. And that is the greatest privilege. Oh, but Jesus just doesn't reestablish our privilege of being his and he is ours. He gives us back our purpose. Something that they lost long ago. Jesus says, listen, I'm, I'm giving you the privilege of being mine, but I'm gonna give you your purpose back. Go into the nations and make disciples. Baptize them and teach them everything I've commanded you. Oh, Jesus said, be a light. Don't hide it under a bushel. Be just like me. Be like a city on a hill. Shine your light for all the darkness to see. Oh, what good is a light if it's under a basket? Or what good is a light if you never turn on the switch? Oh, be the light to the people around you, but bring the light to the places that need it the most, the nations that are still in the darkness. And then do you know what he says? I am with you always, even to the end. Do you know what that end is? It's him. And that, friends, is paradise. He will not only save us from our sins, he will restore us from death to life. And eventually, friends, he will regather us, all of his people, and we will surround his throne and worship him for all time and space. And that, that will be paradise. Who's mission. Whose task is this? It's his. But he's invited you to be a part of it. If you know him and he knows you, then he has authenticated your purpose. There's no one else that has to give you definition. There's no one else who has to write you a job description. There's no one else that you seek answers from. It's him, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. May we not be distracted, ultimately building a city and inevitably building a tower for our own namesake, but may we wholly, undividedly, unadulteratedly give ourselves to the King because he has given us himself. And may we live for his purpose, looking for the paradise that awaits us, which is him. But when Jesus says specifically, this is where you are to go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, we understand that that is ethne, a body of persons united by kinship, culture, language, and common traditions. From what we understand, all, um, all data is coming from uh, International Mission Board and Joshua Project. What we understand with ethnic peoples, that's 12,000 to 17,000 people groups total, 195 ish nations and countries. What Ralph Winter ultimately, he's a missiologist, what he ultimately found was when we just look at Nigeria, what we're understanding about just a geographical location, it's a little bit more complex than that. We're looking at languages, we're looking at peoples, we're looking at different cultures. Papua New Guinea, the country that we ultimately went to to find the Malayali people, Papua New Guinea has 850 distinct languages. What that means is I'm speaking English, you're speaking Russian, and you're speaking Mandarin. We will not be able to communicate. 850 languages exist on a landmass as roughly the size of California. 
Men, when we look at the gospel going to every language in every nation, we have to look at a broader sense of just landmass. Yeah, there might be 17,000, 12,000 ethnic people groups, and they may be found around those 195 geographical places. But ultimately is what we're looking at is it's a lot more complicated than just going to a landmass. We need to be looking at languages. We can ask the question, well, if it's God's mission and we are now in partnership with him, we've been invited, and this is now our purpose as ultimately New Testament church to be about his mission of bringing the gospel and being the light to the places that don't have it, that are in the dark. Well, when will this end? Is it going to end? Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, and this gospel that Jesus was proclaiming, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Ultimately, what we have is a skeletal structure of what we see the end to be. Jesus is ultimately saying, you are, you are going to be longing for me to come back, right? That's when he, he told the other, John's disciples that his disciples will start fasting and praying when he leaves because they will ultimately long for his return. But Jesus, make no mistake, Jesus is like, you're going to long for my return. You're going to constantly, when, when is Jesus coming back? When, oh, people are so stinking fascinated when Jesus is going to come back. People write books, the conferences, every church, I think right after COVID said, you know, let's have a sermon series about when Jesus is coming back. Do you know why Jesus told us the, the point of origin of when he will come back? So we won't lose sight of what's most important. It's not that Jesus is just going to come back but it's the fruition of his mission by which he will come back and gather his people. So when we ask the question, oh, when is Jesus, when is Jesus gonna come back? Well, he's gonna come back at the end. Well, when's the end? Well, he told us. When the gospel hits every single people group, then the end will come and Jesus will come back ruling and reigning as our sovereign savior and king. Don't lose focus. Man, Peter lost focus. All the disciples did. Jesus, oh, I feel so, uh, I mean, I don't feel bad, but I can just imagine Jesus is this resurrected Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has conquered Satan, sin, and death. And his disciples, right before his departure, say, is now the time in which you're going to restore Israel, the once fortune that they had. Is now the time so focused on when paradise would be had? But Jesus is like, listen, that's not for you to know, man. That's for my father to know. But when the Holy, Spirit's, when the Holy Spirit descends and makes you heirs according to the covenant of promise, and you will be my witnesses, privilege, then you will witness beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the wild. Purpose. Don't lose focus. This is our purpose. But we have one of the greatest promises known to man, not just what Jesus' words are, which they are tried true and conveniently motivating. But John, John saw it himself. Man, isn't it just so interesting that God himself would give us the end to his story? Yeah, we understand that this task is God, God's and he's invited us into this partnership of being his privileged witnesses to the uttermost parts of this world. But man, should we die for this? Should we sacrifice all things? Like, yeah, I understand like sacrificing my livelihood, giving up my desires and wants, but should we really give up our lives for, is it worth it is what we're asking for. Is it worth it? 
Dude, he's given us the end of the story. Will it end? He said it would in his ministry. But then John sees not just the resurrected king, but the king who is seated on the throne in the heavenly places as he has made purification of sins and therefore all things have finished and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And he, John, sees this picture and also sees that every nation, tribe, tongue, and language are standing before this king. What more do we need? This mission, you guys, in his mind is over. And we can be confidently, confidently secure that whatever we give to see this mission accomplished will be absolutely worth it. So if this task is his, and he has invited us to play a part in it, and this mission of his, this task will ultimately end, then what remains? What are we looking at today? We have 12,000 to 17,000 people groups around 195 nations, countries, 72,000 are unreached people groups. That consists of 3.5 billion people. This is ultimately what it looks like. 3.5 billion people, 72,000 unreached people groups. And ultimately what we have groups, unreached people groups, among which there is no indigenous community of believing Christians with adequate numbers and resources to evangelize these people groups. That is unreached. Not just unreached people groups, but unengaged people groups. Unengage a people among which there is not one Christian and therefore no indigenous community of believing Christians and no resources for them to hear the gospel because of their language barrier. They are completely cut off. 72 or 7,200 people groups that will never hear the gospel simply because there's too many people. But then 3,000 of those people groups will never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because no one can actually tell them in their language. If this is what remains, then ultimately, what is the problem? What's the problem? Is it people or is it possessions? Who thinks it's people? We don't have enough people, okay? Who thinks it's like possessions, money? We don't have enough money. Man, nobody. Do you guys know what the problem is? What's the problem then? Oh, they're equal? Okay, okay, that's good. So who believes it's people and money? Oh man, some of you still aren't raising your hand. I get it. Okay, awkward. Yeah, you don't want, you know, yeah, totally. Okay, is it people or possessions? There is 57,000 evangelical Christians for every one unreached people group. Is it a people problem? There are 4.5 million full-time Christian workers in the reached parts of the world. There are only 20,000 full-time workers among the 3.5 billion unreached people groups of the world. Is it a people problem? We have enough bodies, right? Can we all agree? We have enough bodies. Look at this. This is where all of our missionaries up to 2010 have been allocated. Is there an imbalance? 
If we are to be the light, yes, it's important that we plant churches and remain in our communities because people need to hear the gospel here. Do they have access to it? Well, you better believe it. What about places and peoples that do not have the access to the gospel because no one knows their language? Should we put a priority upon them? We should, but it's imbalanced. What about money? Is it a money problem? Annual income of all churchgoers is five or $53 trillion. Evangelicals earn $6.7 trillion. Ultimately, what you see, come on, baby. Okay, oh, what you see is if you take all the money that evangelicals earn, and then you show a diagram like Mount Everest. Okay, so think with me. You take all that money and you put it to the ground all the way to the top. Imagine Mount Everest, okay? That's how high it is. That's all the money that's earned. Now, money that actually goes to Christian causes is 1.8% of that $42 trillion annually. That is taking it from the goalpost of a football field and going halfway. Big difference between Mount Everest, right? Now, from there, money going to foreign missions is only 5% of that. That's like taking the money from a basketball hoop and stacking it up. Big difference? Now check this imbalance. The money that actually makes it to unreached people groups is the diameter of a golf ball. It is not a money problem. It is not a people problem. Jokingly, Claude Hickman, have you guys met Claude? Claude coined this, Americans have re recently spent more money buying Halloween costumes for their pets than the amount given to reach the unreached. There is a huge imbalance. And here is where it all gets put on the table. We understand who this mission is belongs to. It belongs to the Lord. And we have been invited through privilege, purpose, and our future paradise of being regathered to him. We've been invited to have partnership with him and bringing the gospel to people groups who would otherwise never hear. Man, it has been promised that it's going to end we see the overall problem. We have enough money. We have enough people, but there's an imbalance. The task still remains. How is it going to end? Now, if you think it's going to end because I call you to your feet and I make you go overseas, I would love to do that but that is not how it's going to end. I hope this is as sobering for you as it was for me. How is his mission going to end? And when we look in Isaiah chapter nine, this is what we see. Not only will the light shine in the darkness for the very first time. Jesus did that in the land of Zebulon and Ephetali. But look, you will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. You're going to completely, Jesus is going to completely destroy Satan and his armies. It's going to be like, 
over. And it's gonna be so incredibly simple because if you know the day of Midian, all they held were some pots and some torches and they shouted. And the Philistine army went nuts and they killed each other. It was so simple. And they just stood and watched. It's going to be that simple for the oppressor to be undone. But not just will the oppressor be defeated, but you will break the oppressor's rod just as you did on the day of Midian for the boots of the warrior and the uniforms blood, uniforms blood stained by the war will be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. It's not just gonna be simple, it's gonna be sufficient. So sufficient that every war and the war of all wars will be completely done. So we will take our weapons and we will trash them and we will take our clothes, roll them up and use them for fuel for the fire because the wars will be done. Why? Because the son will be born and a son will be given. The government will rest upon his shoulders. He will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. The son will reign his government and its peace, there will be no end. Do you know what that means? Well, just a little further. Okay. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor, David, for all of eternity. Do you know what that means? If his kingdom knows no end and it will only ever be increasing, your joy on the first day of entering his rest will only ever increase exponentially along with his kingdom. Your joy and your happiness on the hundredth day you're there will be greater than the first day you will be there. This is a paradise unlike anything this world has ever imagined or tasted or have seen. This is beyond all things. And he's gonna do this. Do you know why this mission is gonna end? Do you know why the oppressor will be defeated? The wars will end, the sun will reign, and his kingdom will be forever and ever. It's the most important little phrase of Isaiah chapter nine, verse seven. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Do you know what this means? If God has been accomplishing his mission since Genesis chapter one, specifically since Genesis chapter 12, and he is today accomplishing his mission, and he will in time bring about the fulfillment of his mission, that means he will use you or not. You can be a part of his mission or not. Man, according to 1 Corinthians, there's going to be people that slide, slide into heaven. There's literally, like it's, Paul wrote, listen, there's going to be people who end up in heaven and although, Paul says, although their lives and everything they did will be burned up, they themselves will be saved. <laughs> we have a ridiculously generous God. But do you know the difference between those people and Paul? Paul says, according to Philippians chapter two, that he wants to stand proud when he makes it into heaven. Do you know what that means? It's not that Paul will stand boastful with his head held high. Look what I did. But rather, Paul will not just be thankful that he made it into heaven, but he will be grateful because he will finally see what he gave his life for. Every nation, every people group, every tribe, every language, and he did it to his very last breath. And he will stand and he will say, worth it. I have to end, but 
but I'm going to call you to radical, risky obedience. Hear me. I'm going to call you to radical, risky obedience. You know what Jesus said when he showed his disciples the task in front of them? A few, maybe thousand Samaritans that were coming to him. He said, look, look at the harvest. It's plentiful. Pray to the Lord of the harvest because, man, the laborers are few. You know, when we see this task remaining, man, don't go. Don't send. You should start praying. And you should pray specifically to the Lord of the harvest. Not for all these nations, not for all these peoples and languages. That has a place. Jesus Christ said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers. Man, I'm going to call you to obedience. I'm going to say tonight, when you go back home, and you have solitude right before your head touches your pillow. I pray that you would intentionally get down on your knees and you would go before the Lord and you would say, Lord, would you please send out more people into your harvest field? The imbalance is there and the perspective is jaded. Something is wrong. Send more people out, but I'm gonna call you to something risky. In this moment, of obedient prayer, I want you to say, are you gonna send me? Would you like me to go? Will you call me to one of these people groups who have not yet heard the gospel yet? Tonight, I dare you. I dare you. Get on your knees and begin to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into his harvest field because the laborers are few, but you guys, the task remains. Do you want Jesus Christ to return? Do you want Jesus Christ to return? Yes, so do I. But he told us he's not coming back until his mission is accomplished. Pray, begin to pray that he would send laborers out to his harvest field and ask, should I go? Let me pray for you guys. Father, keep us in, in peace. My heart is overwhelmed and my brain is rushing and we are just on the edge of this time do everything that my words could not. Father, you are exceptionally good at making our feeble words more than we ever anticipated. The Holy Spirit, work in these students' lives. Work in, in my own heart. Give me the desire to, to sit in solitude and pray that you would be made much of, that your harvest field would be, although it's big, that more laborers would go. Oh God, cause in us, cause in us a steadfast resolve, knowing that it is your mission and we get to be a part of it, that it will indeed end and we have the end of that chapter. We know what's coming. Help us understand the privilege that we have in you and the purpose that you've been given, that you've given to us and the paradise that awaits us in your son, that our joy will only ever increase. Allow us to be a part of your mission that we may stand grateful, not just thankful we made it into heaven, but grateful we got to be a part of it. Oh God, enlarge our hearts that we may run in the way of your commandments. Enlighten our minds that we may understand the power that is ours in Christ Jesus. The very power that you used to raise him from the dead. Give us boldness and courage and a tenacity to obey. Oh, but Father, help our unbelief. Allow us to see this as urgent, necessary worth it. Cause these things, cause these things to be markers in our own lives. And we may draw upon these talks 
this series, this year, and we may point to your faithfulness. Because as your word goes forth, Father, do not let it return void. You are faithful to do what your word has promised, and I believe you will do that tonight through risky obedience. But your good gift in allowing us to be a part of your mission for your glory and the peace and joy of those who we loved and went to to share. Do these things. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.